this is the weirdest Sunday in the world for me. Coming to church. <laughs> <laughs> so I retired uh, into September, and, uh, and Chris said, okay, that's all fine and good and everything, except I've already got plans in November, so you got to come back and preach, you know. So I've been looking forward to it in a, in a nervous sort of way. And uh, thank you all for doing so well while I'm gone. I mean, that's great. And uh, uh, I, was, I was really amazed uh, driving in today. Um, it was like all these memories were flooding me and different things. And uh, thinking about, uh, well, for one, it seems that every time I preach, the next day some building comes down. Okay? That's the. I don't know why, uh, you know. I like this room, you know? And, uh, it's your uh, gift to the world. It's my gift, yeah. So, so we started in the house over in Woodway there, and, uh, and it's no more. It's gone. Uh, and then uh, Romeo's Pizza, where we were, that's now Cabela's. There is no more Romeo's Pizza on Edmunds Way. No, so that's gone. And of course, our church up in uh, Crown Hill, that's gone. <laughs> so I guess tomorrow, this room will be gone. So give yourselves a hand. <laughs> I guess God doesn't want us to get attached to things, you know. So um, uh, anyway, uh, so you know, a couple of years ago, I had that cancer surgery, and. Uh, Every few months, I have to go back to the scene of surgeon and get evaluated and everything. And he said to me this time, uh, I've got some bad news for you. Um, you need to know this and be prepared. You, it looks like you only have um, 20 or 30 years to live. <laughs> <laughs> I went, oh my gosh, only 20 or 30 years? What am I going to do? I quick raced home and told Eileen, I've only got 20 or 30 years. She went, well, that changes a lot of my plans. You know? <laughs> but, um, so... Uh, but then it got me thinking, you know, about the church. Uh, it always comes back to thinking about the church. Uh, it doesn't matter whether we have six months to live, or a year to live, or 20 or 30 years to live, or 70 years to live. It doesn't really matter, does it? Because our time's limited. And so uh, how we live matters. And uh, how how we take each one of those days. And uh, I loved uh, the story Susie told about her friend over on the East Coast who decided, I've got a limited amount of time and uh, probably less than 20 or 30 years, and uh, I'd rather do it celebrating those I love, right? And uh, that's an amazing choice. Um, I hope I have the courage to do that too in 20 or 30 years, you know. Um, and so, uh, the thing is, though, that uh, I was thinking about the church and thinking, okay, so what is it about us, what is it about you all that um, is so unique and so uh, tangible that it gives real meaning to your existence, why you're here, what God has for you, in the days ahead, whether it's 20 or 30 or 70 or one more year. And uh, I thought of a bunch of different things, um, but it came down to, um, I was kind of surprised, okay, I surprised myself because this was different than what I thought I was going to uh, be sharing with you today. Second Corinthians chapter 1. Um, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is a, a merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they're troubled, we'll be able to give them the same comfort that God has given us. For the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with his comfort through Christ. Even when we're weighed down with troubles, it is for your comfort and salvation. For when we ourselves are comforted, we will certainly comfort you. Then you can patiently endure the same things we suffer. We're confident that as you share in our suffering, so you also share in the comfort God gives to us. 
Did you notice a particular word in that that kept coming around? What? Comfort. Comfort. I mean, you must use that more than 10 times in those verses. This is what God does for us. God is the, the merciful Father, the source of all comfort, and he comes to us in our situations and comforts us in order that we can go to folks around us and comfort them, and the circle continues and continues and continues, right? I think that's one of the uh, incredible strengths of Harbor Church, that you actually do this that you're not afraid, I mean, I've been in church uh, a long time. I think, I was thinking up this week, I, I, th I think I've done like over a thousand sermons, with, which is funny, because I only have like one or two messages. <laughs> but, you know, Jesus, you know, Bible, and, uh, uh, and I started to add up how many uh, people uh, preached to, and, and something like uh, between 800,000 and a million people, isn't that weird? That's a long time. They're not all in one place, you know. Uh, we didn't have enough chairs. But um, uh, the thing is that one of the things that really I see as almost a root characteristic of you and your relationships with each other and your ministries and your involvement in the community is that you understand what it is for uh, God to comfort you and you don't let it stop there but you turn to the folks around you and you extend that same, that same comfort. And I, and I wanna um, thank you for that. Because when, when I came here um, a few years ago, before there was a Harbor Church, um, we came out of Minnesota, came back to Seattle, and I would say that I was probably on a one to 10 scale, about a minus two around there, maybe, maybe not that high. Um, I thought my life was over, I thought our ministry was over, I thought uh, we had no friends, we had no church, we had no money, we were broke, and uh, uh, lived in the upstairs of a house with this uh, Russian couple, he was an abuser, and it was like we kept hearing things, you know, it was really hard. And, uh, and the church started out of that. And so first of all, I'd like, to, I'd like to apologize for the first uh, eight or nine years where I was wallowing in it and you just kept coming and listening and encouraging. You, did, you never wavered on the encouragement, even when I'm like barely hanging on, you know. And uh, um, of course, there was that one Sunday where there were only five of us and three were West Falls. That was a that was a low attendance Sunday. Okay, even the people who own the house didn't come that Sunday. You know, so, yeah. But um, let's not dwell on that. <laughs> but you uh, came alongside me and um, and brought healing, and you brought encouragement, and you brought me back to life. So I owe you a great debt. Um, we've talked about what the word comfort in the New Testament means. Um, and, and, you know, Eileen wrote all these books on quilting. Um, she's like the mad quilter of Edmonds. And uh, oh, she's not mad. Well, today she is. <laughs> I wasn't careful in my words, you know. <laughs> But uh, she wrote all these books on quilting, and so she always is telling me the difference between quilts and comforters, you know. And uh, she gets mad when somebody holds up a comforter and says it's a quilt, and that just infuriates her. You know? so, uh, so I just call it all embroidery. <laughs> you know? and, uh, but, but uh, you know, we got this idea that, that to be comforted is like to be wrapped up in something warm and cuddly and feel good about ourselves and so you know feel like oh I'm feeling bad oh things aren't working out or I'm sick or something I need comfort meaning I need to be kind of uh, cuddled uh, I want to eat comfort food <laughs> you know comfort food what, what is that macaroni and cheese <laughs> yeah in, in Walnut Creek Sheila knows this we, uh, it was a kind of a snobby little town for uh, restaurants, so every, anytime anybody opened a 
big new restaurant in the city, they'd have to open one in Walnut Creek too. And the, we had like 40 restaurants that served macaroni and cheese for like 45 bucks. <laughs> That's basically what it was, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, it, it's not... That's not what comfort is in the Bible. In the Bible, the word for comfort is to come alongside and, and help someone become stronger. So when, when Jesus says, I'm going to send the comforter, the Holy Spirit, the comforter to you, it's not to cuddle you. The Holy Spirit's job is not to cuddle you. It's to come alongside you in whatever your situation is and, and help you become stronger as you go forward. That's what you did for me. You were, uh, you were unamused by my suffering. You know, you just didn't. You, you, I don't want to say you didn't care, but you were certainly not impressed with it. You know, I, I never got any of this. Oh, we poor you, blah 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 blah. You're a terrible victim. Uh, I never got that from you. You always kind of went, "Hey, you're a volunteer. Step up." You know, and we're here with you. That's actually what I needed. We're here with you. Let's go forward. And you helped me to become strong. You comforted me. Um. I think that uh, there's a, um, when, we, when we misunderstand the essence of comfort in the Bible, we become like the average church in the city. I mean, you can throw a rock and hit 10 churches around here that you know are all about keeping ourselves feeling good and cozy and comfortable. You know. uh, I'm not naming any, I'm just saying you can throw a rock in any direction, probably hit a church that does that. But uh, that's so not what it is, because the, this, the scripture says uh, the, the God the Father uh, of all comfort comforts us in order that we can comfort others. There's always a purpose in it. It never stops with us. And, and, and that's what I'm so... Uh, grateful to you for that you never thought well you know okay we got what we want so that's all there is blah 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 you know it, it's always um well there's somebody else out here who could use some strengthening who could use somebody to come alongside and make them strong then we're partners in ministry aren't we we're, and we're partners with the Lord, and, and that partnership goes out in so many different ways. Now, for this to happen, uh, it, it takes some it takes a little effort, you know. Um, one is that we have to actually uh, pay attention to the people around us. Notice them, uh, recognize them, and uh, come alongside them. And I would recommend not coming alongside them with a, you know, a Bible tract or something like that to handle. Here's an answer to your problems. You know, <laughs> obviously you got problems. You know, <laughs> uh, not that. But we come alongside them with our own life. I think that um, this started for me probably when I was a little kid in high school and uh, gangly and um, awkward and big mouth. Um, and I went looking for a church and I'd heard about the church in uh, San Diego. I was in Point Loma, which is out here in the Sint, and there was this church over at Lemon Grove is the kind of town that would be like Lemon Grove. They actually had a statue of a lemon. <laughs> Isn't that weird? Yeah, that's weird. And, uh, but I heard that there was this church there, and they had a, a high school, Sunday school class. Uh, and I went to First Presbyterian in downtown, and it had like six kids in the group. Uh, this one had like three or four hundred every Sunday morning. And I thought, that's weird. I bet it's a cult. <laughs> something weird going on there 
there. I don't know what it is, but I thought I'll go try it. So I went over, sat in the back, and there's this room, three, four hundred high school kids, and this really strange guy up front on a, on a tall stool, and he looked weird. He was really, really skinny, and he had kind of a crew cutty thing, but it wasn't the style anymore, ever was. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and he had this kind of loud, boisterous uh, laugh, and he had this deep South accent it was from Mississippi. Jimmy Johnson. And um, I thought, this is weird. This is not, we're not singing and doing Sunday school stuff. What's going All he is, he's sitting up there and bantering with like 300 kids. And they're all talking to him. And he's talking back and everything. And then uh, with about 15 minutes to go, I thought, what a waste. <clears throat> this is stupid. Why did I even come out? About 15 minutes to go, he said, okay, everybody, I've listened to you. I've listened to you. you. I've heard you. Now you have to listen to me. So everybody be quiet. And then he talked to us in a way I've never heard before. And I went, so that's what being a Christian is? That's not like anything I'd heard. Wasn't religious at all. It was just straight to the heart and straight to the, and real life. And uh, after about 15 minutes, he went, okay, you all can go. And I walked out and thought, that's weird. I, mean, I should probably come back and see if that happens every week. <laughs> so I went for a few times. And then one afternoon after school, I, I was at home and the phone rang and there was this lady and she said, uh, John Westfall? Yes. Uh, I'm uh, Pastor Jimmy's secretary and he needs to see you in his office on Thursday at 4 o'clock. <laughs> Crap! <laughs> oh no! What I, I've been in the back row. What I do? You know? Who's been talking to him? How do you know? How do you know? <laughs> you know? And uh, so I worried for a couple of days, and Thursday afternoon came, and I, you know, went out to Lemon Grove to the church, sat there in the church office, and pretty soon he came to the door, and, come on in. And I sat down. He sat down. Uh, so, uh, what's your family like? What? Uh, where have you, where you been last few years? What are you dealing with? Start asking me questions. I'm going, okay, he's going to do this. And then all of a sudden he's going to say, okay, now it's my turn. <laughs> you know, I, I was just so on edge waiting for when he was going to just nail me. And after about an hour, he went, hey, it's great, great getting to know you. I, I saw you in the back row and I thought, I don't know who this guy is. So I thought I'd just have you come in and share a little bit of who you are. That changed my life. I never wanted to go anywhere else after that. I never wanted to be with anybody else after that. He's like the first adult who asked me questions and cared enough and said, well, let's, let's go through the next few years together. Is that what ministry is? Hanging out with people and, and asking them questions and getting to know them and, and not running away if they've got issues? Because you know what? There's like, some of us have issues. <laughs> just, just saying, you know. <laughs> and Jimmy Johnson, in his weird way, his weird deep south Mississippi way, changed my life. Years later, uh, when I was at um, University Press, I wrote a book called uh, Coloring Outside the Lines. And, and they acknowledged my son. I thought, well, I should acknowledge uh, what he did for me. He, he got me started as a Christian. He shaped my view of ministry and life and everything. So I did a little thank you for him. And uh, a couple years later, I get this phone call. This guy with a deep southern accent. This is, this is Jimmy Johnson. I, I picked up this book at the bookstore, and I was reading it. And I got to the acknowledgments, and then it started talking about me. <laughs> and then he started to cry. He said, you know, I never thought that anything I ever did mattered to anybody. Mm -hmm. Ever. And he just started crying. I said, well, it mattered to me. It changed me. You walked through part of my life. And it, and it transformed me. I think that's what comfort is. 
We just walk through it. We, we hang in there, even when we don't feel like it, even when it's rugged, even when we don't get along, even when it's a struggle. We still stay in there. And we, and we walk through it together. And in, the, and in the process, we become strong. It's funny, that weird thing, that weird Thursday afternoon that I remember, probably shaped the 40 years of pastoral ministry that I had. It, it probably shaped it. Uh, I probably wouldn't have been a pastor if it weren't for that little Thursday afternoon invitation. Don't think you don't matter when you come alongside somebody. It matters. It makes a difference. Now, the downside of this, you all know, if we're going to do this, if we're going to love people, if we're going to care, um, then it's going to hurt. I'm sorry to say that to you. Oh. I, did, I didn't mean to shock you so. <laughs> have, you ever, have you ever tried to love somebody and, and it hurts? It, uh, misunderstanding, issues, problems, all those things? Well, it does. And so the temptation is, I don't want to hurt anymore, so therefore I won't come alongside anybody anymore. I'll pull away. I won't let people come alongside me because it hurts too much. I understand that. You know, when I got blown up in Minnesota, I didn't want to ever go to church again. Ever. Anywhere. Um, Billy Graham could have been preaching next door. I wouldn't want to go. I, I just I couldn't do it. I just could not bring myself to go to church. I remember I lived on one Easter Sunday, first Easter Sunday. Well, it's Easter. We got to go somewhere. No, I can't. I can't walk into a church. And so when we were starting Harvard Church, I was having breakfast with a guy, a friend uh, who uh, he started uh, F5 Network Company, the big company down the waterfront. And uh, he found that. And we were talking about things. And he goes, So what? Who's your church for? What's Harbor Church? What is that for? I go, Well, honestly, it's for people who don't want to go to church anymore. <laughs> he goes, Oh, I understand that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but the thing is, uh, we don't have the option. If we're going to follow Jesus, if we're going to let the Lord be the God of comfort to us, and then we turn and comfort others, we don't have the option of, of pulling away. And I, I, uh, I promised Bruce Larson on his deathbed that uh, I was going to... Uh, Always quote him. <laughs> so Bruce, I'm keeping it. This is what he wrote in uh, Living Beyond Our Fears. Okay. Keep in mind the purpose of life is not freedom from pain. If you have enough money to hire medical people to keep you comatose, drugged, and fed intravenously, you could go through the rest of your life never having to feel pain. But that's hardly living. The purpose of life, according to Jesus, is to love God with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbors as yourself. That means loving a world full of people who are desperate for love. Starting in your home or your neighborhood, do that, and you will experience pain, I promise. We say often that uh, the life of faith is a journey, but what kind of journey is it? Is it a journey from one luxury hotel to the next? If we think that and get stuck in the alley some night, then of course we take painkillers, drugs, alcohol, sex, anything to ease the pain. But the Christian life was never meant to be a journey from the Hilton to the Marriott. It's a journey through the wilderness. Sometimes we do arrive in luxury hotels, but most of the time we're camping out. The point is we're moving. Kind of like Harbor Church, right? Always moving always somewhere else. We're on our way and accommodations are not important. God's people do not get special treatment. They get a companion, 
the companion who promised never to leave them or forsake them. Look for a minute at this matter of pain from God's point of view. If God had wanted to avoid pain, there would be no people. Really, that's where all the problems come from, isn't it? <laughs> I know it has in my ministry. You know, if we had a church with no people, I would be the greatest pastor. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> all my problems over the years have been with people. Anyway, that's just a side thing. <laughs> Sorry, Bruce. Okay. We've been a problem ever since the Garden of Eden. We've been rejecting him, betraying him, ignoring him. We are a pain in the neck to God. Had God been unwilling to accept pain, there would be no relationship possible with this creation, and there would be no redemption in it. Why should we be any different? If we're going to fulfill this mandate, to be comforted by the God of all comfort, and in order that we can come alongside others and make them strong, comfort them, it means that we're gonna hurt. I know, okay, this is gonna be a shock to you. Sometimes people will let you down. <laughs> Speculating, I know. <laughs> Not this group, but you know, there are others. Uh, uh, sometimes you're gonna let them down. Sometimes you're not going to be there for them. I, I remember we used to, I went to new members classes down in, in California, and I'd tell other new members, okay, I apologize, because you're going to probably fall through the cracks sometime, and I'm going to not be the pastor you need me to be. I'm sorry. And they go, oh, no, we love this church. We're going to join this mm. church. Over here. Yeah, about six months in, that pastor wasn't there when I needed <laughs> That's what I apologize for. You already forgave me for that in advance. <laughs> so, ha! <laughs> I tricked you. But you know what? It's not about our comfort. It's about our comfort. Our being made strong. It's not about getting the folks around you comfortable. It's about getting them comforted so that they're strong. That's what you did for me. That's what you did for me. I think back on those first few years, and I think, how in the world did any of you ever endure this? You know, I always had some whiny story about, you know, blah, blah, blah. And yet you were relentless. I got, you know, Pam just came in. Uh, the first Sunday we, we opened our church, she called up and said, uh, don't you need a, a baby grand piano for your church? I went, I don't know. We've been in a pizza parlor. <laughs> what do I know? So she had a baby grand piano deliver, which by the way is now up in the fireside room because the wrecking ball's coming through tomorrow. We don't have to move it today. Oh, it's in the sanctuary now. It's now in the sanctuary room. So, but it's on the move too. Yeah. <laughs> so it's on the move. But the thing is, you know, that, that helped us worship for the last many years, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, she came alongside and helped us be strong, right? There in Karen, showed up at our place. They've helped us be strong. They're comforted, they comfort us. Each one of us, I mean, you guys wandered in at an odd time in your life. Yeah. and. Uh, I don't know, I even found us back in those trees Facebook. and stuff. Facebook. I know Facebook, I know Mark put a little ad on Facebook, and they came in, they were kind enough not to tap on it so we didn't have to pay. <laughs> <laughs> so, that was a miracle. But let me interject here. We, sh we showed up during a difficult right. time in our life. Right. But we met you, and you also were going through a difficult right. time in your life, and we felt safe with you because you shared your vulnerability with us Good. and I think that you started but see no oh, just don't blame me <laughs> <laughs> actually God started it yeah. <laughs> but the thing but think about this though what you just said 
when we come alongside someone and help them be strong, it's not that we're doing it out of our strength. Yeah. We're doing it out of our weakness. And that's so important. We, we all need the Lord. We all need a miracle today, right? We all need help to get through this thing called life. And, uh, and what does Paul say? You know, I'm glad you brought that up because this is a good way to end this message, okay? <laughs> I don't want to circle the planes forever. You know, so we're going to bring it down for landing. So here's the deal. God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. When we're afraid to be weak and to share that, God's not able to be strong. Yeah. It's when we reach out and come alongside someone to help them become stronger in our weakness that God's strength is shown the most and demonstrated. That's what you do. I'm not whooping you and saying go out and do this. I'm saying thank you for doing that in my life. And in their life. And in their life. And in their, you know, that, thank you for doing that. Don't stop. Don't stop. Don't become strong and comfortable and all those things. Let God comfort you so that you can comfort others. Is that all right? Can we do that? All right. Why don't you stand? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you love us so much and you promised not to leave us, not to forsake us. You've come alongside us and we need you to stay right near. So surround us with your love and your care. Surround us with your peace and your power. And surprise us with your joy. And we'll give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.